I definitely get caught up in terms of the looking at people and feeling like, oh, they disagree with, you know, yep. um, these things that I think are core to being a good person and um, providing everyone with equal rights. And I am I get really up in arms and then I'm like, okay, they're a person, yep. they're coming from their experience, that's the only way that, you know, otherwise you, all you have is anger and I yep. think the anger just gets in the way. Hello and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today I am joined by a guest who was here right in the early days of this podcast. I have Verity Craft, who is a um, speaker and thought leadership coach with Intelligent Inc. Welcome back, Verity. Thanks, Deborah. I'm excited to be back. It is. It's cool. So we had a lot of uh, really good feedback about your last podcast. And so we thought we'd bring you back on again. And I know that you're actually focusing a little bit differently these days in terms of how you can use thought leadership in business. Yeah, 100%. I think we've, you know, learned and evolved as you do over the years in business yes and um now we're seeing a real uh a a real shift in terms of how you can use thought leadership to have a really big impact so not just in terms of your reputation and obviously growing that to grow your business but also in terms of how it can help people um and then I personally am on a lot more of a speaking journey which is really exciting because that's I love to be on stage so (laughs) it it feels really exciting to be doing that to build my own thought leadership as another mode of doing that absolutely that's cool so I mean those of you well those of the people who are listening who don't know you tell us a bit about Verity and about Verity's kind of history and how you got into where you are today yeah, very randomly <laughs> is yes. the short answer. Um, so we definitely evolved into thought leadership. So when I came out of uni with a degree in French and Spanish and no idea what to do with that, um, I talked to a lot of people. I did some random jobs, um, worked in truck dispatch for three months, if you believe it. Wow. Um, and then eventually ended up talking to my now partner, Christina, um, who went through university with my sister. And my sister said, hey, you might want to talk to Christina and see if writing's something that you'd like to do. And so started off working for her and then eventually we ended up, you know, I started off managing the team and then we eventually partnered up. But over the years, what's been really interesting is that the business has really changed and I think that's why I stuck around was because we were able to evolve it into something that I felt had bigger impact and also was better suited to our strengths and passions and everything. So we went from being essentially a copywriting business um, that did a bit of PR uh, into saying a few years of saying yes to everything as you do early in business yes. before you learn you shouldn't. <laughs> um, and then eventually realized that what we were really good at was helping people make their thinking better and that led us into thought leadership. And then over the past probably six years or so, it's really just been an evolution of that and discovering how we do that most effectively, how we can have the biggest impact and how we can help our clients have the biggest impact as well. Sure. So what is thought leadership in your opinion? So thought leadership, I like to say, if you break it down to the words, it's basically what it sounds like. (laughs) It's really good thinking. So it's great ideas that could help people matched with the leadership. So the willingness to go out there and share those ideas, sometimes even when they might not be, you know, universally accepted, um, it's that willingness to go out and bring people along on the journey with you. And so if you're doing that, if you're coming up with really great ideas, if you're doing some really great thinking, and then you're going out there and sharing those ideas and in a way that's going to bring people along for the journey, Mm -hmm. that will help you not only um, serve more people because if your ideas are good, then they can help people, they can create change, um, but also will set you up as a leader in your industry and help you build that reputation. So that's why we love it because it's that balance of doing good with doing good for you. (laughs) Excellent. I love it. Really great to think of it actually because I suppose the more recognized you are, the more impact you can have. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the the basics of it, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Because then people will share your ideas because they respect you. And, you know, if you think of your big thought leaders out there, like your Adam Grants and Brene Brown, Mm -hmm. because they've gotten those ideas out there and then built their reputations on them, other people share those ideas and therefore they are able to have more impact. So it's much more of a a ripple effect. Mm. But there's also people in the commercial world as well. You think Mm. about Elon Musk, Richard Branson, those guys Mm -hmm. are very much thought leaders in their own right as well, aren't they? And that's enabled them to create their businesses that can have a huge impact. Um, And I think they probably enjoy the the attention they get in a while as well. (laughs) I would definitely say for those two, yes. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I would have a really good, because I mean, Brenna Brown and Adam Grant, they they come from more of a 
research um, sort of background. Mm-hmm. Well, who are thought, thought leaders in business? Have you got sort of people on that you think of about thought leaders in business? Yeah, so I think thought leaders in business tend to, when you get to the upper end of um, of businesses, so sort of bigger businesses, yep. it tends to be that the thought leadership becomes about the organization instead of the individual. So, for example, we work with a business task group who um, work in with all sorts of retail brands like McDonald's globally, and they've got a real focus on thought leadership. And so they're actually all about pulling all the expertise from their team. So mm-hmm. we're working with lots of different members of their team because they've all got different areas of expertise. Yeah. And then collectively, they create this organizational thought leadership um, and that's been their approach to marketing is that um, as opposed to sort of a traditional SEO approach or or something like that they're really focusing on thought leadership because mm-hmm. um, it helps them stand out from their competitors yep. um, but there are definitely you know entrepreneurs business owners you look at people like um, Denise Duffield Thomas who uh, wrote was Chillpreneur originally, I think, and now it's Chill and Prosper. Yep. Um, and she's built this massive business, but also has spread this message that you can build a massive business without needing to work 80 hours a week. And, <laughs> you know, um, so there's people like that as well. Um, but there are across industries, you find them. And it's not necessarily that everyone is well known across the board, Mm -hmm. um, but they might be really well known in their industry. um, And that's actually where the real power comes from. It's not about being famous. It's about being influential and having an impact. Yeah, I was just thinking about a couple of my clients, actually. So um, Hannah McQueen from Enable mm, Me. Great example. Very much, uh, mm-hmm. uh, she, I mean, it forms the whole culture of her business. So they yep. all in their own right are thought leaders, but they're changing the way that people think about mm-hmm. managing money and how you create wealth. Yep. And then also Naomi um, Ballantyne from Partners Life. Yes. You know, there's a lady example. who's absolutely passionate about changing the insurance industry mm-hmm. and how do they actually do that and what can she do? And she, she pushes the boundaries with her thought leadership to actually yep. change the way the whole industry operates. Yeah. And I think that's when thought leadership is really exciting, when it's not just about you as an individual or you as a business. Mm -hmm. It's about making some kind of bigger change. It's, you know, you can see where the industry needs to go and you're out there talking about it. Yep. And what we find is that, you know, not only are you able to then help the industry and, and affect real change, but that always comes back to your business as well in terms of people see you and respect you as a leader in your industry. Hmm. Does it ever have the opposite effect where it might put people off and they think, well, you know, mm. they might be too big to be working with me or I don't know. I'm just wondering if there's, an, if there's a, a balance to that because – I think about, I'm thinking about Gary V as an example, right? Mm. It's like obviously he did really well in his own family business and he kind mm-hmm. of create, um, he bought a media company or created a media company. And I wonder if some people kind of think now or maybe we are not able to work with him because he's so famous. I don't know. I mean, it could put some people off, but I suppose then it comes down to being really aware of who your target audience is yeah. as well. So because that's going to define what you're selling them essentially. So yeah. you can be out there talking – in the industry, um, and it becomes all about making sure that you're really clear on who you're talking to. So for Gary V, yeah, you're right. Like some people may go, oh, he's too big. I can't work with him. But there are other people who have arguably just as big followings and they've got you know, it might just be an online course or it might be a That's group program. Thinking. You can reach that, that person another yeah. way. It's not always one-to-one. So exactly. Like, so just because you build your own personal brand yep. doesn't mean that you're going to be tied to your business being the only person that can deliver. 100%. Hannah's a great example with Enable Me. She mm-hmm. creates lots of mini versions of Hannah who actually deliver on the service and the, yep. and the brand promise that she kind of goes out with. So, yep. yeah, it's about how you build your business to support that. 100%. And, yep. like, even, you know, if you think of the name of your podcast, yes. Like that's kind of what you want to do when you're building thought leadership is it's not about creating more work for yourself. Yeah. It's actually about using that reputation and that impact to build a business by design that's going to work for you. Mm-hmm. And also what we find is that in a lot of businesses, and obviously it depends on your industry and, and the way that you work, but in a lot of businesses, there are ways to impact more people that is less hands-on. So yeah. a lot of the clients that we're working with, whether they're coaches, consultants, trainers, um, just experts of some description, they will go and create different offerings to match different levels of commitment. And obviously the price changes with those as well. So they might have an online course for somebody who's just starting out, but then their one-on-one might be worth 
you know, 10 times, 20 times yep. what somebody pays for that. So I think that's the thing is that you can use it to design the business that you want. And it comes down to how well you design the systems and everything that sits around it. Absolutely. Um, and I think also using your original example of the company that is chasing mm. thought leadership, that in actual fact, you can actually, even if you're not a, a natural extrovert or somebody wants to go and have that as a company, you can actually still be a thought leader in your industry as well, right? hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. And I think the other thing is like what you've just said, if you're not an extrovert or something, there are lots of different ways to build thought leadership. So yeah. we tend to think of the ones who are speaking and they're out. <laughs> You know, either. yeah, yeah exactly. Muscle, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's quite funny because so Christina, my partner, is actually in the process of writing her book at the moment, and it's all about we haven't quite figured out the term, but it's basically the reluctant thought leader, and it's those right. people who have really amazing ideas, but they might be shyer or quieter or more considered, or and they look at you know thought leadership that's out there and go, oh. I don't know if that's for me, yep. but they want to have an impact and there are ways of doing that. And it's not necessarily, you know, being out on a stage in front of thousands of people or, yep. um, yeah, there, there are different ways of approaching it depending mm. on who you are and your personality and how you want to impact. And I suppose it has to be authentic too, doesn't mm -hmm. it? It's like you can't, um, you can't force yourself to go up on, well, you can force yourself on stage <laughs> if you want to, but, you, but it has to be about being true to yourself. So when 100%. you're actually up there, you're not pretending to be yeah. somebody else, you're not trying to be a Gary V or a, a Renee Brown. I actually yeah. think Renee Brown in the beginning was very reluctant about mm -hmm. actually being on stage and talking. Yeah, she's and talked about yeah. being an introvert and, and really struggling with that in the yeah. past year. Okay, so you work with all kinds of people to actually help them mm -hmm. um, to develop their thought leadership. Where do you start? So we talk about there are four things that really make you successful at thought leadership. Okay. And the first one is clarity. So much like anything in business. Say, that's very much like EOS. <laughs> it is <Yeah>. very similar. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you do not know where you're going, you will not know how to get there. <laughs> Amy Rebel, was it, was it Alice in Wonderland, wasn't it? If you don't know where you're going, any Rebel will get you there. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. So clarity is the first piece and there are a few key pieces of that. So first up is knowing what your vision for thought leadership is. So mm -hmm. actually being really clear on what kind of thought leader you want to be or how you want to build thought leadership. Um, um, because for some people, it's not about being out on big stages. It might actually just be being a thought leader in their local community, for mm -hmm. example, um, or in their industry within New Zealand or whatever it is. So being really clear on where you're going and what you want that to do for you as well. So what opportunities you want it to open for you um, and what impact you want to have. So how you want to help other people. Yep. So where you're going first and then how you're going to position yourself as a thought leader. So there's a lot of people out there doing the same thing. <laughs> you know, we all have, um, I don't like to call them competitors because I actually think that, you know, it, it, there are ways, it's not necessarily that we're all in competition, yeah. um, but there are other people out there doing similar things to you. And so figuring out how you can position yourself in a unique way is really important because then it just becomes a case of going, okay, well, how am I best placed to do that? Yeah. So that clarity piece is really important first. And that's always what we would look with, with anyone, even if they're already, you know, pretty far down a thought leadership journey, they've been trying out lots of things. They might be out speaking. They might be um, using LinkedIn really effectively. It's still about going back to those basics and getting really clear on where they're going to go mm -hmm. so that you can figure out a plan to get there. Sure. Okay. So we've got clarity, first of all, where you're going, um, what impact you want to have, how you're going to position yourself. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. So then the other three C's <laughs> are concepts next. So this is your ideas. And this is where thought leadership really differs from, you know, just using social media, just marketing, just being an influencer even, yep. which is that thought leadership is about your ideas and about getting those ideas out there so that they can help people. Yes. Um, so it's having really clear concepts and being really clear on how you're going to communicate those mm -hmm. because um, I, I've called out a few people recently and I've called myself out on it as well because I've definitely fallen prey to this, yep. which is that if somebody else is confused about your idea, yep. it's probably because you're not clear on your idea and you haven't done the work to figure out how to communicate it. So you can test it out and make it better and evolve it, but you have to be really clear on what is the core message that I'm trying to get across? What's the core idea and yep. how am I going to best communicate that? 
for impact. I think that's very much like business, right? You, mm-hmm. Even when you're in business, you got to think very, very carefully about you know what, who is it you really serve, mm-hmm. what is it you actually do for them, what is that real clarity, and we tend to want to try, especially in the beginning, that whole say yes to everything, <laughs> want to be everything to everybody. But if we try, if everything's important, nothing's important. Yeah. So how do you actually really focus back in on yeah. what is really, really important? Yeah. Does the concept have to be completely original? No. So this is a really interesting point is, you know, you don't want to go out there and pretend that somebody else's idea is all (laughs) yours, obviously, but there are no fully new ideas. We are all pulling on the knowledge that we have and the things that we learn from other people. You know, creativity Mm -hmm. is just your brain making connections between things that it already has in there. Yep. So you are absolutely able to reference other people and and build on what other people are doing, but it's all about bringing your unique perspective to it. Yeah. And that might just be a, a different way of communicating a similar message, mm-hmm. or it might be bringing a different story and experience to it, or it might be creating a, diff- a framework for something that's never had a framework or a model before. Um, but it's really important to recognize and um, acknowledge where you have brought inspiration from yeah yeah i'm just thinking again i, I think i always put my us hat on i think about the whole traction book that gino wrote mm-hmm. and i always say to people look when you read this do not expect to fe- to find anything that is like mm. rocket science or revolutionary because he very clearly says that he worked uh, with the likes of jim collins and he mm-hmm. worked with the likes of Vern harnish and um oh gosh dan sullivan and mm-hmm. sam cup and all those guys and really just took parts of their ideas what he did was put it into a framework mm-hmm. that then became distinctly unique for him based yeah. on his experience of working in his family business 100%. and so you know he's very honest about the fact that they aren't all his concepts i mean it, uh, the emith stuff's and everything's in there yeah. but it's just his way of bringing it together in a way that he found that could work so yeah. you're right there's not that many absolutely new unique ideas out there is there yeah and i would argue that if someone is coming out and saying I am the only person to ever think about this, <laughs> yeah. that I would be a little bit suspicious because mm-hmm. then where's the the proof? Yeah. Whereas if you're able to say, well, actually, you know, we took inspiration from this framework and we read this book and we did this and then this is what we've come up with based on our own experience. Yep. That's actually a lot more believable and trustworthy than someone who just says, I've come up with this brand new thing that no one has ever thought of before because I'm so brilliant. (laughs) Okay, so once you've got, you see, concepts don't have to be absolute unique, um, but they just have to have a flavor or a story or something that is um, unique to the way that you Mm -hmm. are actually presenting it. Yeah. Okay, what's the next C then? Next one is consistency, and this is the hard one. <laughs> <laughs> and again, I'm thinking about business hat on and going, this is just like business too, right? 100%. People who go out and start a business expect to have immediate results overnight. And the amount of people I've seen who go and start a business yeah. and literally after six months go, oh, well, it's not working and I'm going to pack it in. Yeah. And that's the lack of consistency, right? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> and I often equate thought leadership to investing. So, uh, you know, all of the inv- invest or the investing advice that I follow generally yeah. is that investing is a long term game, mm-hmm. and so you want to cons- you want to invest um, a sm- consistently and often. So it's better to do a small amount consistently than it is to do a massive amount and then nothing for yeah. years. Yeah. Um, and I sort of look at thought leadership the same way. It's better to be consistently building it up than to go out and ha- make a big bang and then never do anything ever yeah. again. You're going to have more impact and. Just like investing, it's a bit like compound interest. So at the start, you might not notice that many. Obviously, you want to try and get some quick wins on the board so that you feel motivated and want to keep going. And we always try to make sure that that happens. But like you really start to see the impact long term um, and it becomes a little bit like a snowball because as you start to do more and and get in front of a bigger audience, then those people start sharing your ideas and then the people that they've shared the ideas with will share them. And, yeah. and so it just builds up. And often what we find is there's like a, a tipping point or something yeah. where all of a sudden <laughs> our clients will go, oh, I finally, like I can see it. They're like, I kind of, you know, I could see the benefits and all of that. They're like, I can finally feel it now. And so, yeah, the consistency is really important. And actually, I mean, I hate the whole, uh, the people who talk about the classic hockey stick, but it is in terms of when you're actually building this kind of um, Mm. thought leadership. Same with the podcast, right? When I first started in the podcast, it was a little bit disheartening at first with the number of people you actually had listening to it. And it took a long, long time, but then all of a sudden it just, Mm -hmm. it was that compounding interest, I suppose. Yeah. Suddenly you've got 
got all these people listening in and regular listeners and they're telling two people that they know yeah. and they tell two people that they know and before you know it, it's a snowball effect. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I, it's consistent. <laughs> because I think we got, it wasn't until we got to episode, God, I think it was something in the sort of 70s or 80s before we yeah. actually started to see that growth, which was like, yeah. wow, finally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and most people give up before yeah. then, right? Like yeah. that's the case in business. It's the case in thought leadership. It's the case yeah. in podcasting. Most people give up before they see the long-term yep. benefits. Um, and so if you can stay really focused, and that's why the being really clear on your vision mm-hmm. is so important because yep. if you're not clear on where you're going, it's really hard to stay focused yes. and actually remain consistent moving towards that vision. Okay. So consistency is about smaller, small amounts and often as opposed to big bursts and then yeah. lack of anything for a long, long time. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. There's another C, isn't there? There is one more C <laughs> and that's community. Uh-huh. And that's because you cannot build thought leadership alone. So okay. we might look at thought leaders and go, wow, like look at Brene Brown, look at Simon Sinek, you know, look at all these people. They did not do that alone and they will all absolutely claim that. So there's a huge number of people that you need around you to build thought leadership. And that is people, you know, that it might be your team. It mm-hmm. might be the team that you've built up. It might be your colleagues. Um, it could be other people in the industry. It could be mentors. It could be coaches. Um, but what it's really about is having people who are going to challenge your thinking. Right. Because if you think that your idea is perfect to start with, you're probably kidding yourself. (laughs) So there's people to challenge you. There's people to support you as well and to share your ideas and to start that off. And there's people who are going to just keep you motivated when it does get hard because like business, as we've already said, it's a consistency thing and it is going to be hard sometimes. Sometimes and good days and bad days, exactly. right? It's just like life. I mean, that's yeah. what I was saying. I think you've got to, yeah, you need to have people who will kind of lift you up when you're feeling a little bit down. Um, yeah. But also, like you said, challenge you because actually, um, I remember when, when you, you and I have obviously known each other for a long time, but when we had the common and it wasn't mm-hmm. working, when you're so in, ingrained in something and so close to it, it's hard to actually see the bigger picture. 100%. And so having an advisory board was kind of a bit of a wake up call for me. It's like, oh, yeah. okay, they're challenging my thinking, which I think is yeah. great because it meant we developed it um, in different ways. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And then, you know, you're obviously, as a thought leader, you're going to build your community in terms of the people who want to engage with your ideas as mm-hmm. well. But I think starting with that core group of people who will challenge you and will support you and will, you know, who want you to succeed, yep. but are willing to yeah, call you out yeah, on your well, yes people. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah. And um, it's one of the reasons that Christina and I often say that we've stayed together, working together this long, yep. is because we have really similar values and very different personalities. <laughs> yeah. And I think the team sometimes find it quite funny because we will absolutely just call each other out on bullshit. Yep. And because I'm very much, a, I get excited about new ideas and I want to do new things. Yes. And Christina's a, a you know, methodical thinker. She likes to have the information. Mm -hmm. And so together we make each other better because I, you know, drag her towards action and she makes sure that we're actually taking the right actions instead of just diving into whatever. Sounds like a classic Um, visionary integrated relationship. (laughs) (laughs) Which is what is needed though, because, you know, at the end of the day, I'm I'm a visionary myself. I've got Mm -hmm. lots of big ideas and they're always, some of them are really, really great and some of them are really, really terrible. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and we need the people who are a little bit more sensible to kind of challenge us on it and just um, allow us to have those ideas, not shoot them down, mm. but allow us to kind of reflect on them and mm-hmm. decide whether or not they really truly are great ideas. Yeah, totally. And yeah. one of the things we often do when we're working with clients on an idea is we ask them to try and argue against their own ideas. Oh, yes. Because actually it's a really interesting um, exercise to see whether they can, because yeah. I think thought leaders need to be really open. And we often talk about strong opinions lightly held. So, you know, be really clear on what you believe and what you're trying to achieve and, and get behind your ideas. Yeah. But if new information comes along, yeah. be open to it. Yes. And so forcing people to argue against their ideas, it's an old trick that I learned back in high school debating. debating I just yeah. Like, <laughs> I, you know, I didn't do my first debate till I was about, it was only about two or three years ago. I'd never oh, wow. done any debate. And I got obviously put on the, they always put you on the opposition, opposite side yeah. to what you actually believe in. And it was really, really cool because yeah. I realized that actually I enjoy um, seeing both sides yeah. and, and being able to fight both sides. But also it was interesting just at a personal level. I was with a, a, a fellow at US 
Kristen from over in Sydney the other day and we were having a, a girly night after our session. And she, I'm a bit of a royalist, right? I can't help mm-hmm. it. I'm British. I'm very much, you know, <laughs> love the royal family. And I've always thought that Harry and Meghan were just absolutely, you know, terrible and right. And then she had the exact opposite view. She's American. Mm-hmm. She loves Harry and Meghan. She hates the royal family. And even just a list, you know, asking her questions and yeah. listening to what she had to say, I have to say it kind of made me think, Okay, I had never considered that. And actually, maybe I've been a bit sort of bigoted in terms of the mm. way that I was thinking about the royal family. Um, and maybe it. there's a chance to actually adjust that a wee bit. So it's really interesting. Oh, and I love that you've been so open to that. It's, I read a book recently called Both End Thinking, which, oh, yeah. to be honest, wasn't the easiest read, but I loved the concept. <laughs> yep. Um, it, it yeah, I think, I think it could have been easier to engage with, but <laughs> yeah. the concept was really important, which was that we live in this world where people are constantly told you have to pick either or. Mm. And actually, all of our best solutions and the way that we can solve our problems come when you embrace the both and thinking. So, yeah. you know, both there might be benefit to the monarchy and Harry and Meghan might be fine. You know, it's, it's <laughs> then embracing both of it. So that's what we try and embrace a bit with thought leadership is going, sometimes there can be two ideas that seem like they, they are in conflict. Yep. And actually they can both be true and it's mm. reconciling those and finding a way to reconcile them. And often that reconciliation, that space between is where the really interesting ideas come out. So I'm, I'm struggling a wee bit with politics at the moment because mm-hmm. I was brought up very, very right wing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so naturally I tend to lean towards the right. Mm-hmm. But then part of me actually believes that socialism has got a, a huge amount of value. So I think I'm a socialist capitalist, if that mm-hmm. makes any yep, sense. Totally. Um, because I'm kind of going, actually, I don't believe that either is necessarily the right way. And, the, mm-hmm. and I think there is a way to actually combine both totally for the greater agree. good. Yeah, yeah. But we, we live in a world where the media loves to make everything black and white, don't mm-hmm. they? And, it, and politicians particularly like to make things kind of black yeah. and white, yeah. 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 So as a thought leader, you're saying that you should be very much open to having your strong ideas, mm-hmm. but being open to anything else that um, that might change that or might just give you some uh, some better rounding of that thinking. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Adam Grant calls it, calls it thinking like a scientist, which I really appreciate, which uh, is yeah. that you make a hypothesis, you say, I, I believe this idea to be true, you go out and you try try and prove it or disprove it. And it's okay if it's wrong. You know, scientists are used to disproving their own hypotheses. Um, maybe some less comfortably than others. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's it's yeah. taking that experimentation approach and going, okay, well, here's the problem that I'm trying to solve or here's the goal that I'm trying to achieve or here's the, the opportunity that I see. And then looking at it as an experiment and going, well, this is what I believe. How can I go and pull together information, whether that's through, you know, the work that you do with your clients or your customers, or whether that's through research or whether that's just by sharing it on LinkedIn and getting feedback, you know, but treating it as an experiment. Um, So actually the four C's that we've talked about today started out as the three C's and Ah, I shared it on LinkedIn (laughs) and the concepts one was what came through everyone's feedback. They were like, wait, the ideas are missing. Um, And sure enough, they were right. So we took it and added it in. That's really cool. Um, What is just going to ask because the social media thing is a really interesting thing, mm. right? Because when you do have strong opinions and you put them out there, mm-hmm. um, people really do get polarized by it. And mm-hmm. there can be some really awful comments and things. And and I'm a bit of a softie at heart. So I've got a very, very hard exterior, but I'm a bit of a softie <laughs> inside. And so sometimes you kind of read these things and it, and it, it really affects me. I kind of go, mm-hmm. oh, why are they, they don't know me. I'm actually a really good person. How can they yeah. think that of me? What's your advice to people about, first of all, I suppose, even reading comments? Mm. And secondly, how do you take those on board? What do you, how do you have to position that in your mind? Oh, it's so hard, isn't it? It's <laughs> yep. not nice for anyone. Um, <laughs> I would say it comes back to being really clear on what the impact is that you're trying to have mm-hmm. and who you're here to serve. Right. Because when it comes down to it, like, yes, people will have so many opinions. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Everyone has opinions. And unfortunately, the internet makes them feel like they can share those opinions in a way that isn't always kind. Yes, that's very true. Um, yep. So what I would say is there's sort of two things. Is one, remembering why you're doing that yep. um, and focusing on the positive impact that you are having. Obviously, we all get affected by those kind of negative yep. comments. I certainly don't enjoy them. I remember <laughs> one message that I got that I still, like every now and then it 11 p.m. at night, I'll, <laughs> it'll just go through my head and I'll be like, oh, how could I have reacted to that differently? Yep. Um but 
yeah, it's focusing on why, what, what you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it. And who you're trying to impact. And who you're trying to impact for sure. Yeah, They may not be even the kind of people that you or the, 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 yeah, it might not be the, the person that you're trying to impact. Yeah, exactly. And then the other thing is just remembering that everyone is human and, um, like there's a, there's a person, Alok Menon, I think his name is, who he is a, um, sorry, they are a non-binary, uh, person who is, uh, basically an advocate for trans and non-binary people. Yep. Um, and yeah, I shouldn't have misgendered them. Um, but they are really amazing at taking the awful comments that yeah. people leave on their social media posts um genuinely horrific ones about how they should die and I can't like, it's, with that. I, yep. I can't even imagine <laughs> yep and they respond to them usually as sort of another instagram post with love with kindness and they and they mm-hmm. go back to them and they say i'm really sorry that you know you're living with hate in your heart and basically just treats them as people and you know People shouldn't be putting comments like that on. It's horrendous. Yeah. And, um, you know, much as I wish they would all go away, I feel like it's less about whether it's going to impact on the person commenting and more about what it does for you. And I think if you can approach that negativity with kindness, with it won't affect you as much yeah. um, as it does. Um so, yeah, those are the two things that I would say. And then say. you get to find your genuine supporters too, right? Because yeah. Because the people who genuinely support you or um, who believe in what you're doing will actually come in behind all of that mm. and actually almost offend you on your behalf, which mm. is which can be a good thing. So, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Social media's got such a lot to ask, answer to. Yeah. It? yeah. <laughs> it's it's a funny how people think I'm, I'm behind a keyboard so I can just write anything I want and it's like, yeah, they, they forget there's a person. Yeah. There's an actual person on the other end. Who's totally. Actually yeah. Is. Yeah. yeah. There's, I must have but I, I definitely get caught up in terms of the looking at people and feeling like, oh, they disagree with, you know, yep. um, these things that I think are core to being a good person and um, providing everyone with equal rights. And I'm, I get really up in arms and then I'm like, okay, they're a person, yep. they're coming from their experience, that's the only way that, you know, otherwise you, all you have is anger and I yep. think the anger just gets in the way. And like I said earlier, yeah, you get brought up in a certain way. And so for a lot of us, we have these um, these core values that exist within our, within our family mm. that we get brought up with. Yeah. Hopefully, we could become a bit, little bit enlightened and we decide if they're the right core values for us and what kind of works yeah. for us, what doesn't. But for some people, they don't have that opportunity or they don't, I don't know, they don't embrace it. Yeah. So you've got to remember that they're just coming from what they know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah 100%. Yeah. 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 And as you said, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's, it gives you another chance to kind of think about the way that you actually engage and the way that you react to people too. Mm-hmm. Which I think it's really important. And you said, you know, your husband and you, you both share the same values, mm-hmm. but you can approach things in completely different ways. And you, totally. you, you, you know, my husband and we are poles apart on every <laughs> on every single scale but we do share the same um, fundamental yeah. core values yeah. which means we will clash at times in a big big way mm-hmm. when we're talking about politics and we're talking about religion, yeah. all kinds of things but um, at the end we have at least a, a way of being kind and respectful yeah. and working through it and we both get to grow from that yeah exactly and I think that's the case in business it's yep. the case in relationships it's the case with thought leadership it's like actually if you approach everything from a perspective of I'm open and I come at this with curiosity and kindness, then, you know, yes, there are still going to be people who are awful and, you know, (laughs) but it won't affect you as much um, because you're coming at it from a really different place. And I always sort of think is the way to approach that is if somebody really, really is winding me up and I feel that they're being really awful, you kind of go, okay, um, have some empathy. It's like, so Mm -hmm. where must they be in their own space to feel that way so strongly about something? Yeah. Um, That must be really awful to have that, that such a strength of feeling when, you know, you could be a whole lot kinder. (laughs) So true. I think about that I've got a 15 month old daughter now and she is definitely you know she's hitting that tantrum stage and it's exactly (laughs) the same way that you have to approach a kid because you go like she's when she gets really worked up and starts screaming Mm -hmm. she's not doing it to annoy us um much as it feels really hard you know she's doing it because she's frustrated and she doesn't know how to express herself and and so I think in some ways you know, if you can treat treat the nasty people on the internet a little oh, bit like sure. toddlers, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe yeah. with a little bit less condescension so that you don't get in trouble that way, but, yeah. um, you know, and come at that going, oh, you're really 
frustrated or you've yep. been brought up in this way that, you know, you haven't been shown kindness or whatever yeah, it is. That's right. Have some empathy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Tell us a little bit about the speaking because we've talked a lot about thought leadership. Yeah. What about the speaking? What's that about for you? Yeah. So the speaking for me is because I love being on stage. <laughs> I love people. I'm your classic extrovert. Yes. And I, you know, I love doing musical theater outside of work, although it's a little bit harder to do now with a baby. Yep. But um, I love being on stage because I think it's the best way to just instantly connect with people and mm -hmm. instantly share ideas and see their reactions as you're sharing their ideas. Right. So speaking isn't for everyone, but for me, it's like total happy space yep. and a place where I can yeah, really just test out ideas and get them in front of people and see how they respond to them and see which bits connect with them emotionally. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so this year I, I made it a goal that I'm going to grow my speaking business um, and obviously still, you know, use that to drive back to the business. But Really, I'm growing it because I love it and I want to do more of it. <laughs> Excellent. You know, my whole philosophy is like doing what you love with people you love. Totally. Make a difference. So that's really cool. So what do you talk about? So I talk about thought leadership, but on a more universal level, I guess, yeah. which is how do you lead with your thinking? How mm -hmm. do you put forward ideas that are going to help people and use that to build your authority and, and your reputation? Yep. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm still developing that and evolving that. And I'm sure that will evolve as <laughs> I carry on. But yep. right now that's where I, I place my focus and it's all about helping people stand out in a way that feels really authentic and like they're having an impact. Yep. Fantastic. Hey, Verity, um, we're sadly coming to the end of the podcast. We've been talking for a, a, quite a while already. In terms of um, helping people out there who perhaps are interested in this whole thought leadership thing, mm -hmm. obviously we've got the four Cs, the clarity, mm -hmm. the concepts, consisting community, but where would they even start? What would you suggest they do if they were thinking about, well, is this a, a thing for me? Do I, have, do I have some concepts that are worthwhile even exploring? Yeah, I think... To be honest, if they're even asking that, they probably yeah. they've probably got something right. <laughs> yes. um, so I would be starting by putting together a thought leadership strategy and yep. getting really clear on where they want to go. Um, we can help people with that, but there's also you know resources online and things that they can look at. You've got um, a tool, haven't you? On um Yes, we do. I'm just trying to think which tools are where, but yes, yeah. on our website. We'll, we'll put a link are... on the bottom of the podcast yes. somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, absolutely. And just getting a really clear picture of where they should focus their efforts. So like we've got a, um, um, an thought leadership audit tool that might be, might be helpful in figuring out, okay, well, here's where I'm doing pretty well. Here's where I need to focus my efforts. Nice. But I would start by thinking about where do you want to go? Yeah. What do you want to do? Um, and then if you do need help with that, then they, you know, you can reach out. Absolutely. So how do they reach out? How do they get hold of you? Yeah. So a couple of different ways. LinkedIn, feel free to connect with me. That's where I spend a good portion of my time. <laughs> um, so LinkedIn. Otherwise, our website is intelligentinc.co.nz and you can contact us through there. Yep. Um, and yeah, just just reach out that way or there are also links on there to, to book a call with me and happy to jump on a chat. People. And you don't just work, because you've got a .co.nz site, but you don't just work with New Zealand, do you? You work with people around the world. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, we've got clients in the UK, in the US, in Australia. Yep. Um, so, although we started here in New Zealand, it's very much become a global thing, and we're excited to to grow globally as well. Oh, that's awesome. Hey, look, thank you so much for your time. I always love having a chat to you, and it's <laughs> great to get you in the studio again. Thank you. Thanks so much, Deborah. Pleasure.